Course in Miracles, we teach out of the Blue Book, the FIP version, but we honor all versions because they're all leading you to the same voice, and that voice is within you, within your mind. And we're going to be looking today, starting a new chapter, chapter 24, which is called The Goal of Specialness. And in the original version, it's called Specialness and Separation. Introduction. Forget not that the motivation for this course is the attainment and the keeping of the state of peace. And that's important right there, because that's that's the ultimate barometer of what you're doing in your, quote, journey. It's not about getting rid of all your problems, or getting a better job, or fixing your income, or building an organization, or reaching numbers of people, or writing books, with nothing wrong with any of that. But the motivation is the attainment of a state of peace. The Holy Spirit said that the reason for the happy dream is that it is a dream that is given when you attain this state of peace. The Holy Spirit says, I have to get you out of fear and get you over into peace so that you can begin to hear what you need to hear for the correction to come as the correction needs to come. There's a passage of scripture that I always loved from the Bible that says, let peace be your umpire. Peace has got to call shots. So all that list that you just alluded to, those are fastballs, curveballs, slow balls across the plate. The Holy Spirit is the umpire saying, all we're after is peace because it's in that state of mind that I can communicate to you what you really are. Given this state, the mind is quiet and the condition in which God is remembered is attained. It is not necessary to tell him what to do. He will not fail. Where he can enter, there he is already. And can it be, he cannot enter where he wills to be. Peace will be yours because it is his will. Can you believe a shadow can hold back the will that holds the universe secure? God does not wait upon illusions to let him be himself. No more his son. They are. And what illusion that idly seems to drift between them, has the power to defeat what is their will. So Jesus is starting out this portion of the course telling us the will of God, your will, they're one, and they've always been and always will be. God is not doing anything. He is there to be remembered. Once you get still enough, the course says be still an instant and go home, be still and know that I am God. Because it's only the lack of stillness and the lack of peace that is blocking your remembrance. You can't forget the Father. No. You never did forget the Father, and you never forgot yourself, and never can. So it's all sitting right there for you to become aware of again. What I love about these introductions that Jesus presents, and he says he's he's establishing a very important subject here, this thing about specialness. He leads off by saying, okay, I know all your defenses. So what I'm going to do is I want to lay down the foundation that totally disarms you from all of those defenses that you can come up with as we get into this subject. So every bit of this, if you'll look at it, this is what he's doing. He's saying, look, I know you're going to say this, and I know you're going to think that. I know you're going to come at it from this angle. So let me up front just Take away all that so that you can get in peace and receive what I'm about to say. You ever talk to someone trying to convince them of something and they come back and say, no, 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 that that ain't for me. You just don't know what I've been through or how bad or whatever the situation is. Jesus already knows that we thought we did this and we thought we did it purposefully. And we stay in the illusion and we stay in darkness purposefully. It is our wish can never be our will, but it is our wish. And we think we have taught ourselves so well about this world and this wish that we had that Jesus actually compliments us in one place in the Course about our ability to learn. And he knows that he's dealing with a mind that thinks it has done all this. And he kind of smacks that mind in the face saying, I know you think you're really cool with all this stuff you generated, this making you did. But it's all specialness. Right. This making you did. 
But it's nothing. It's a shadow. I don't need to hear all your defenses. Because I, I already know about all your defenses. Right. That's why I love these introductions, because he disarms you. And he's disarming those who want to be disarmed, of course. To learn this course requires willingness to question every value that you hold. Not one can be kept hidden and obscure, but it will jeopardize your learning. No belief is neutral. Everyone has the power to dictate each decision you make. So Jesus brings in a couple things here. Number one. Value. First is your valuations. Then he talks about learning, which is teaching and learning. I just mentioned it. We made teaching and learning. There's no teaching and learning in the heavenly thought. We made teaching and learning, and the Holy Spirit uses teaching and learning to unlearn the entire concept of learning, right. basically. And then he talks about, okay, now he talks about belief and decision. So we lock our learning in by the power of mind that we made up called belief. And now all our valuation and all our decisions about the valuations and the judgments we are making are based on this trap. It's a dysfunctional mind. It's the misuse of mind. And see, the power of belief is the power to make your own reality. It says in one place that your reality is based on your belief. That's why it's possible for you to believe the unbelievable belief, the unbelievable thought. It's because you make your reality based on that belief system. So it's a willingness to embrace peace. Peace puts you in a position to where you drop the beliefs, you drop the values, and you allow yourself to recognize through contrast between what's real and what's not, where the true value is. And this is what he's headed towards, is laying down a true value system that's not in specialness. For a decision is a conclusion based on everything that you believe. It is the outcome of belief and follows it as surely as does suffering follow guilt and freedom sinlessness. There is no substitute for peace. What God creates has no alternative. The truth arises from what he knows, and your decisions come from your beliefs, as certainly as all creation rose in his mind because of what he knows. So now he's contrasting knowledge and perception, or this world of perception which is made through teaching, learning, belief, valuations, judgments, and Locking yourself in to that which you call, quote, real. Because whatever you do, the conclusion of all of that mind activity is what you think is real. The distortion of the law of creation is what I project, I believe. And this is how projection makes perception. So whatever you're projecting, you will believe it. And you will believe that is real. And it has all kinds of variations of what is reality. That's why we talk about boys from the real world. The real world is still an illusion, but it is all of that teaching, learning, and faith, and belief, minus the activity of the body in perception, of seeing, replaced with vision, which now reflects a world that is sinless, that is guiltless, that is full of light and has no darkness. See, the voice from the real world, you could say, is the voice of peace. Because it's saying, listen to this voice that will put you in a frame of mind or a state of mind to receive what the Holy Spirit is saying. Not what somebody else is saying, not what some book is saying, but what is the Holy Spirit saying to you in this very instant, because the Holy Spirit operates in the instant. And the instant you choose to listen is the instant you will hear. He's again contrasting knowledge and belief. You can't get back to knowledge as long as you don't see the real world. As long as you're not using your belief and your valuation and everything. If you're using it to see an unnatural, unholy world, you cannot wake up and return to knowledge. You must have a happy dream, see a real world that is now a reflection of your will. Right, forgiven. It is a different wish. It is a wish of the Holy Spirit. But now it is something that leads you beyond all of that back to knowledge, which the Father and the Son function in and always have functioned in. So now we come to 
specialness as a substitute for love. Love is extension. To withhold the smallest gift is not to know love's purpose. Love offers everything forever. Hold back one belief, one offering, and love is gone because you asked a substitute to take its place. All right, so let's stop there. Love must share, and love must share everything. It is. That's what the Father is loved. That's what the Son is loved. That's why the Son must have creations, his own creations, because love must extend. Love is extension. Love must extend everything. So there are no creations that are not everything. There are no some of these, well, they're just fly around and they help. And No, all the creations of God are the creation and the extension of everything because otherwise it would not be love. If it is not that, then it must be a substitute. Substitute is a concept. It says, I can have something that is less than everything or different than everything. And I can use the power of my mind to make it so. Once you knock over the domino of substitution and specialness or difference, that's all you're going to get. You're going to get domino after domino of substitution. And that's why there can be no exclusion in the thought of God. There can be no exclusion in forgiveness in the miracle ministry. There's two stones, you could say, are the foundation stones for the thought of time. It's all based on this disassociation, power of the mind made to disassociate, that is, hold two thoughts at the same time in the mind, but value them equally. One's true and one's false. The second thing is the ability to substitute for all that was real something in its place. Eternity, time. Life, death. It's all based on those two thoughts. Now, we, through belief, have built this thought system in this substitute disassociation. In this beginning here, in the introduction, he deals with this ability here to disassociate from this. You can't hold on to anything in the illusion and take a hold of reality. So we're dealing with two things. Specialness through difference and disassociation from anything that will take that specialness from me. And in that sentence where he says love offers everything, he includes the word forever because this is totally associated with eternity. With reality. Yeah. You can't have everything in time because time in and of itself is a separation of past, present, and future. It's a limit. It is limitation, so therefore cannot be everything. And now must war, the substitute for peace, come with the one alternative that you can choose for love. Your choosing it has given it all the reality it seems to have. So we substitute something, anything, for love. We substitute the false for the true. We substitute perception for knowledge, death for life, time for eternity. And now, he says, we are making up our own reality. But it's really, we've only substituted one thing, conflict for peace. Peace is the condition of heaven. Conflict is the condition of everything we think is not heaven. And so you cannot have conflict without differences, without specialness, without a judgment as to who's the winner and who's the loser. Yeah, it says you made a thought system without love. Love's not in it. So if love's not in it, guess what's in it? War. Levels conflict with levels. Every personality that you see, you see them as different. And you see them as a threat because they are representative of another level. And they are a threat to your specialness. Your little life is your specialness. And they are a threat to that. Because they're different. Because they're different. The, the condition of heaven is... All the sons are the same. They all have and are everything. So a condition other than that is a fearful condition. It is a suspicious, the ego's range goes from suspicion to viciousness. That is the operation function of this unnatural idea, of this tiny mad idea, or the echo of the tiny mad idea. Paragraph 2. Beliefs will never openly attack each other because conflicting outcomes are impossible. 
But an unrecognized belief is a decision to war in secret where the results of conflict are kept unknown and never brought to reason to be considered sensible or not. So this has to function in darkness. You talked about the dissociation. We have to interject the time and the unknown outcomes here because there is a sure outcome. When you put peace against conflict, conflict disappears. When you put peace against war, war must disappear. When you put truth against illusion, illusion disappears. In the holy instant, at the altar of the sun where we bring all illusion, there is no conflict. Right, because they come face to face with reality. And in our, quote, story here in the United States, a good example of this would be, if you could truly see, Jesus talks about, if you want to operate in judgment, then you have to know everything about everybody, everything down the line, what it's going to impact the entire deal. No one can do that. So let's look at the Iraqi war of 2003. It's all this unknown. He's got these things. He's got the yellow cakes or whatever. (laughs) And we got to take the time to present this and put our argument for what we already decided we're going to do. We were already decided we're going to war. It's just a matter of how it's going to play out. We got to find justification. So now we do what we do, and then we find out, oh, well, they didn't have this, or they did have that, or, man, maybe we should have just left that guy where he was. It was a whole lot. See, as long as we're staying in the conflict, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We are in conflict. But if we would have laid it all out and got it all in instant, we said, no, well, we ain't never doing war again. But you don't do that in this thought. It's kept in darkness, and our beliefs affect each subsequent decision, a subsequent decision, because the decision is in time. And see, the thing about the levels, levels are in conflict because levels are suspicious of each level. So what do you do in that? First of all, you build this defense system in case they strike first. And then you become so paranoid, you go ahead and strike first because you know sooner or later they're going to. It's an aggressive position of fearful defense all the time. All the time. And many senseless outcomes have been reached and meaningless decisions have been made and kept hidden to become beliefs now given power to direct all subsequent decisions. So now we have what you call a precedent that we have set here. This is how we responded to that in World War II. So we will respond now based on our previous outcome. We try to learn lessons, but lessons of war are dark lessons. <laughs> dark. So. The, everybody says, well, we'll never repeat Vietnam again, but yeah, we did. <laughs> and of course, we're dealing with the thought that's in the mind. We're not dealing with the symbols that we see right. in this thing we call time. We're dealing with where is this coming from and what is it for? It's always the question of what is it for? Well, then we got to look at the mind because the mind made it for a reason, and that's to protect the thought, and that thought is special. It's through difference. And it doesn't matter if it's on a geopolitical level it or is. within your special relationship or your Community church or your group or whatever. Yeah, whatever. It's all based in relationship and suspicion. Mistake you not the power of these hidden warriors to disrupt your peace. For it is at their mercy while you decide to leave it there. The secret enemies of peace, your least decision to choose attack instead of love, unrecognized and swift to challenge you to combat and to violence far more inclusive than you think are there by your election. Do not deny their presence nor their terrible results. All that can be denied is their reality, but not their outcome. I saw a comedian last night, a young lady on Conan, and she was kind of funny. I wasn't paying that much attention. I was doing something else, but I remember the last thing she said. She was kind of a tiny, insecure type character that she's portraying in her stand-up. And she goes, I've got a new motto. I'm not the victim. That got my attention, so I looked up at the screen. She goes, come on, everybody, say that. I'm not, and everybody goes, I'm not the victim. She goes, right, I'm the killer. (laughs) (laughs) It was hilarious because that's right. it was true. Right, it is absolute true. (laughs) I'm the killer. See, when you are the victim, when you play the victim, you're killing the person the Son of God, the Great Ray, that you think victimized you. That's why you're playing the victim, because you want to kill, you want to bring guilt and destroy and crucify the Son of God that is across the table from you. You chose an identity that's based in fear. So that's your identity. 
So you'll always react based on the identity that you've chosen, and it's fear. Because this is calling us back to peace, what we really are. There are no exclusions. All the ego mind is the ego mind. And it's played out. It seems to be on different levels and seems to be variations, but it's the same thought. But we've been around people that you just knew everything that's being done is ammunition that's being stored up as a judgment. And it's not going to be fired yet. But one day, like a shotgun, it's going to come at you. And it does ultimately come at you. Massive, we have lots of stories a, a on that. A massive ammo dump. Dump, right. <laughs> one volley. <laughs> <laughs> Paragraph 3. All that is ever cherished as a hidden belief to be defended, though unrecognized, is faith in specialness. Now that is so important. Listen to what he said there. Won't you read it one more time? All that is ever cherished as a hidden belief to be defended, though unrecognized, is faith in specialness. It is hidden so that it won't be recognized. So that you can justify your action to protect your specialness through difference. It's not how you're different. It's that you're different. It's not that you have more than I have and I have less. My less means I'm special because I'm different from your more. It doesn't matter. It's about difference. This is what is secretly, secretly hidden. And this is what, when you take the lid off of this thing and you see, it's not about who's fighting who or who's doing this or who's... Who's right or wrong. That don't mean a thing. It means that they are seeking their level of difference, therefore being special because they're not the same. The son is the same as the father, but he asked to be different than the father. And the father said, son, I can't give you that. Your specialness is in your oneness with me, not in difference. But the son says, I'll make time and I'll be different. So in your creation was love giving everything to you. Just like your brother's creation was love giving everything to him. And the acceptance of all. But when he said universe before, he's not talking about the natural universe. He's talking about the, the true creation of God. If you want to be special... In the creation, you would have to say, Father, I want less than everything because then I can be different from my brother. Now, once you believe that, which is a substitution for love because love can only give everything. The Father couldn't give that. Now, I just want more. So more in the dream means more of less than everything. I don't want everything. And I don't want everybody to have everything. I want more of less Which means than everything. difference. Right. So the richest guy in the world has more of... Actually, less than everything means nothing. So he has more of nothing. And the poorest guy in the world has less or hardly <laughs> anything of nothing. And they think they're different. And the Course tells us the reason we keep coming back here is because we think we can find more. Right. More of what? That doesn't mean, oh, I'm going to come back so I can make another $100,000 a year. No, the 100000 a year didn't work. I'll come back and I'll have more poverty. I'll have more sickness. I'll be the ugliest person, the ugliest body that has ever shown up in this dream. I'll try that because it's more and it's different. See, if you made yourself special through difference, then difference is the key thing here. you got to be different. It don't matter how. You see, I understand now. I believe more clearly than ever why Jesus used the prodigal son in the course of miracles. The prodigal son says, Father, I'm just like you, but I want to be different. Give me my portion. Well, son, your portion is everything. How can I give you a portion of everything? Give me my portion. I'm leaving here. I'm going to go be different than you, and I'm going to be special. And I'll make it work. And I'll make it work. And so this is the picture of the prodigal son. The prodigal son takes his portion, which is an illusion within itself because you can't divide totality and wholeness that you already are. He goes another place. Place represents time and space and distance to get away from what he was as a picture right. of his father. That's why it but has to be in darkness. He, but then he wakes up in this specialness through difference and says, you know what? 
I want to go home to dad. I want to go back to father. And so he returns back to the realization, my specialness was there all the time in my oneness and my sameness and my wholeness with the creation of my father. The father never missed a lick. It's come and have what you've always been, what you've always been. Now this journey back, this supposed journey back, is wrought with time and distance. How long will it take to get back to Father's house? What's going to happen? Do I really want this? What is the fear when I face the Father? All these doubts of beliefs in this belief system. That's why you have to value everything that we just read. Every evaluation must be, my Father is love, therefore I am love. Well, see, how did the Son come to this conclusion? The Son was able to contrast Father's house with what He had chosen. And he raised his head out of the pig pen and says, Father's house is better. I see the truth. I want to return to my true state and my true identity. But it's done through contrast of what's real and what's not real. This takes many forms, but always clashes with the reality of God's creation and with the grandeur that he gave his son. What else could justify attack? Who could hate someone whose true self is his and whom he knows. Only the special could have enemies, for they are different and not the same. And difference of any kind imposes orders of reality and a need to judge that cannot be escaped. Orders of reality. So now we got all kinds of levels and calls it orders of reality. What's real? It doesn't matter what it is as long as it's different. Right, and in these degrees represents this order of reality. See, so you've, you've built this house of difference, of specialness through difference, but you've built rooms and you've filled those rooms with degrees. You've got health and you've got sickness, but then you've got degrees of health and degrees of sickness. You've got all of this that makes up this illusionary reality with degrees and levels, and each degree and each level is special within itself. Therefore, it has to be different in order to be special. So it's valued in that. All these dark closets of difference and of specialness. And it says now there's a requirement. Once the mind is entered into this arena of orders of reality, now there's a need for judgment. Now I have to determine which order is correct or right and which one will I be comfortable in and then once I find it since it's only my reality then I must battle with everyone else against their order of reality to protect my order of reality well think about this the professor who has the major in mathematics meets the professor in the hallway that's got the major in history Each one thinks their major supersedes the other major. They've invested in their major. They didn't want that major. So here's a degree of difference. They look like they're civil, but they're really different. And in their differences, they're specialists. And in their specialness, there's war. It's not obvious, but it's buried there. And there's judgment there. It's interesting. We know that the mind made aspects and degrees and intervals. But that term degrees, you brought up academia. So if I come into a room and I say, hello, I'm Dr. Rich. Oh, great. What kind of practice do you have? Oh, no, I got a doctorate in English. Oh, I thought you were a doctor. (laughs) (laughs) Or uh, here comes this guy in a white lab coat. Hi, I'm Dr. Rich. Oh, are you a brain surgeon? I'm a veterinarian. Oh, well, I thought you was a real doctor. See, it's all based in the levels and specialness, and what do I hold? got to share this with you since you brought that up. I had forgotten this. When my wife was spending so much time in the hospital before she passed away, and I was talking with one of the nurses one day, and she said, have you seen Dr. So-and-so? And And I said, well, such-and-such come by. She says, hmm. She says, what kind of lab coat did he have on? (laughs) She said, if it's such and such a coat, then it's a doctor. If it's another type, even though they're white, the length and the difference, they mean something. So 
You know them by their coat. <laughs> you know them by their, they got a symbol of difference so that you can identify them at a distance and adjust how you deal with them. So see, even in the little, minute things like that, the guy that don't deserve the coat, the lab coat, he better not put that coat on because he's posing as a doctor. <laughs> he's not a doctor. So in symbolism, everything is there for reading. There has been a judgment made. Right. What I'm going to wear, how I'm going to walk, how I'm going to look, how far up this chain I'm going to go, all of this stuff. And it's not just an academia. We're using that as an analogy. But I'll give you another analogy. I was in Detroit recently, and I go into uh, with a friend of mine who likes watches. He's not a flashy guy at all, but he likes watches. And we go in, I want to look at the Camaros at the Chevy dealership. And this young, this kid couldn't have been more than 20 or 21 years old. Hey, hey, you looking at the Camaros? Yeah. And he goes, hey, I'm so-and-so. I said, hi, I'm Rich. My friend goes, hi, I'm Ken. And the guy immediately goes, Oh, is that a so-and-so watch? It wasn't a Rolex, but it was some type of watch. Now, knowing about what I know about this, I immediately recognize what's going on here. Why is this 20-year-old kid focused on this guy's watch? Because his judgment and his success is based on finding the right customer who can actually buy the car. <laughs> yeah. And there's an old story about Bob Dylan back in the 60s walking into a dealership and looking like a hippie and all that and none of these old cats the old salesmen would have anything to do with them this is a like a, a not mercedes or a, a rolls royce dealership and they're thinking oh who's this guy so the young guy goes out and talks to him and bob dylan ends up buying two rolls royces or something like that and they're all in shock as well what is that so this whole idea about how people are dressed and how they come in is a big deal in sales but the one thing that they talk about is no matter if they're trying to deceive you and look like the Bob Dylans, you know, they come in with their T-shirt and everything. Look at their two things, their watch and their shoes, their jewelry and their shoes. Ring, don't pay attention to rings. They'll take their rings off, but they won't take their watch off. That's how much valuation is in this understanding the differences and the orders of reality to try to win this game. It's, it's all the game based. of specialness through difference. And difference of any kind imposes an order of reality, a need to judge that cannot be escaped. What God created cannot be attacked, for there is nothing in the universe unlike itself. But what is different calls for judgment, and this must come from someone, quote, better, someone incapable of being like what he condemns, quote, above it, sinless by comparison with it. And thus does specialness become a means and end at once. There you go. Cause and effect have come together. For specialness not only sets apart, but serves as grounds from which attack on those who seem beneath the special one is natural and just. All right. So, so we're, here's we're, levels. So they did mm -hmm. levels, dealing right. with levels. Because think about the term levels. Levels means I am the special at this level. No one is at this level I'm at. There's something above me that I don't understand. Because levels are in conflict with each other for that reason. There's something below me that I don't understand, but I'm not so concerned about that below me. It's that that's right above me because their specialness seems to be above my specialness. How can I get that? How can I be more different and therefore more special? See, this is why you have the serial killer because they're special. Why do we have a station dedicated to him? The specialness in the difference. That's why. That's all it's about. There's not one like him. He still holds that place of specialness through difference. So now everybody is a judge. They're not judging above themselves. They're judging below themselves. So I live in middle class and I can dog the people that go to Walmart and the way they dress and everything else. Now the guy that Bill Gates doesn't care anything about the people at Walmart. But he might care about, am I, am I still number one or number two on that most rich list? Whatever, as long as there's difference in judgment, it keeps you locked in to the thought. Now, when we talk about judges, we think in the courtroom, when the guy in the black robe comes out, man, that's a righteous dude or a woman. And they must really have it together because they're about to render judgment on us peons that are doing stuff wrong. 
And there will be consequences. There will be cause and effect here. Respect the court. And you think about it. We're talking about how these thoughts show up in the dream in form. And let's talk about the robe. Who wears robes in our society in the United States? Judges, religious figures, and academicians. The guys with the robes and the flat caps on their head. That is a reflection of the thought of orders of reality. There's education, there's religion, and there is law. Law. These are the biggies, and we allow them to wear the robes. Now, if you go walking around in a robe today, you watch what happens to you. <laughs> They're going to have you in the loony bin because you didn't earn your robe. Well, it's like the doctor and the coat that he right. wears. He's, it's for the doctor. If you said, I forgot my coat today, and, and the doctor with the long coat says, well, wear this. I ain't wearing that coat. No, I didn't earn that. I didn't earn it, and I'll get nailed for it. Right. I'll get sued for it or something. Right. Yeah, I'll be seen as something I'm not. Right. That's what this whole thing is. You're trying to see yourself as something you're not. And see, you got to remember, this is all about what caused the mind to think that it could give up heaven. Special Mr. Difference. That's so valuable. That's what this whole value system is about. It's special, Mr. Diff. Have you noticed that commercial? I hadn't seen it lately, but there's this lady, and she's looking out the window at the neighbor, and the neighbor drives up. It's a car commercial, and he drives up in his pretty new automobile. And the hubby walks up behind her, and she says something about his car, and he says, mm, uh, must got a raise. And, and you can tell this is boiling with the couple and their jealousy over why. Special Mr. Difference. And that's another. The automobile is a big <laughs> deal as to show to be a reflection of where are you in this order of reality, in this order of society. Right. What are you projecting out here? What image are you electing to project? Because that's all this is. The false world is nothing but image making. I saw. For specialness not only sets apart, but serves as grounds from which attack on those who seem beneath the special one is natural and just. The special ones feel weak and frail because of differences. For what would make them special is their enemy. Yet they protect its enmity and call it, quote, friend. On its behalf, they fight against the universe for nothing in the world they value more. See, this is how the mind tricks itself. And you got to go back to the foundation that was laid down here that says, look, you value this more than anything, but you hid from yourself what is your value system. So the guy that's different, or the girl that's different, and she gets attacked for her difference. She becomes the victim, but then she has allies that come to support her and to make her feel justified because she's been attacked. So she values the whole operation. The whole thing is set up. And what does the whole thing equal? It equals specialness through difference. The first miracle principle is... There is no order of difficulty in miracles. One is not harder or bigger than another. They are all the same. All expressions of love are maximal. So there's no level. Right. So the extension of the miracle, your utilizing forgiveness, being a miracle worker, is for the purpose to take this specialness and differentiation out of the mind, even out of your thought about what you're doing in forgiveness and miracles, until there's no exclusion. Until you recognize, wait a minute, I am the miracle. We are the miracle. There's no need for miracles. And there's no the need same. for forgiveness. All the sonship is the same. When the mind has that, it is beyond all symbols. It's beyond forgiveness. It's beyond all miracles. And it is in the real world, ready to easily translate back to the knowledge See, of See, that's song. why you can't minister the miracle until you receive the atonement for yourself. Because you're going to do it in specialness if you try. If you try to, you can't do this in specialness. You'll just go repeat what we've been repeating over and over and over in religion. You have to be free from it yourself. Now you can extend the sameness. The specialness is in the sameness with the Father and the Son. They're one. It returns us back to oneness. And that's what the Course is for, to utilize forgiveness, to allow the mind, the Holy Spirit in the mind, to do exactly what you just said, to be exactly what you just said. Specialness is the great dictator of the wrong decisions. <laughs> here is the grand illusion of what you are and what your brother is. And here is what must make the body dear and worth preserving. Specialness must be defended. If you don't have a body, and 
I don't have a body. If we're just mind, how can you tell we're different? You can't. Okay. Because there is no difference in mind. But the belief that mind is trapped in a body now gives the mind the ability to trick itself to say, of course I'm different. I'm richer. I'm more attractive. I'm less attractive. I'm different. Why? Body. That's why the body is the hero of the dream, because it is the symbol of differentiation. Absolutely. And multiple variations. I came in law enforcement, so they say that no two fingerprints are the same. That's probably likely true. Someone may look like exactly like someone. Man, they look at close, but if anybody really knows that body, they know that they ain't even really close. Look at this, look at that, just like you would examine a fingerprint. And I have the feeling it's the same with the DNA and everything else because the domino is different. So everything that comes out of that mind as a projection is different. That was what the son asked for. Special Mr. Difference. And it must be defended. Illusions can attack it, and they do. For what your brother must become to keep your specialness is an illusion. He who is, quote, worse than you must be attacked so that your specialness can live on his defeat. For specialness is triumph, and its victory is his defeat and shame. Now see, this is so key here, because the way specialness through difference works is in a subject that you've taught a lot about, what we call this special relationship. It's joining or trying to join with another level of specialness. See, you're only interested in the level, because that level can enhance your level. So therefore, you join because that's a different level. The good-looking blonde, when I carry her on my arm, they'll say, God, how in the world did he get her? Well, what happened? Her specialness elevated me up to a specialness that's above you, that's looking at me saying, how did he get her? And see, it works that way until that specialness is no longer working. So now I have destroyed, I have, as a vampire, you have cannibalized. You cannibalized that level of specialness and got all of it you can get. And now you move on and look for more specialness. Special must, must be defended, and illusions have to attack the specialness. So the person that finds himself at a certain level is going to not attack five levels beneath them, they're going to attack the level right beneath them. Because that's the real challenge. And you'll see, in, I, I mentioned law enforcement, somebody gets mad if they hurt someone in their family instead of where the real issue is in their mind. Or you see this often. The problem is with the authority at work. I'm going to go kill those guys. And I saw one where he actually did a video of himself. I'm going to leave right now, and I'm going up there, and I'm going to go right up to the head boss, and I'm going to kill him. And then what did he do? He drove down the street to McDonald's and shot people in McDonald's. Why? Because I have to release this anger and hate over this specialness. But I really can't even deal with that. So I'll just kill these people hanging around in McDonald's. Because right. right. they're people that are hanging around in McDonald's. They're more like me. Right. They're closer to me. It's, it's total insanity. But it is based in attack. If you're in difference, you are in the thought of hate and attack. Because in order to have difference, you crucified the sun. Conflict. You destroyed heaven. You think you did. And you... Pulled the father off the throne. That's what this is all about. Illusions can attack it, and they do. For what your brother must become to keep your specialness is an illusion. He who is worse than you must be attacked so that your specialness can live on his defeat. For specialness is triumph. It's always about winners and losers. And its victory is his defeat and shame. How can he live with all your sins upon him? And who must be his conqueror but you? Would it be possible for you to hate your brother? If you were like him, could you attack him if you realized you journey with him to a goal that is the same? Would you not help him reach it in every way you could if his attainment of it were perceived as yours? You are his enemy in specialness, his friend in a shared purpose. Specialness can never share, for it depends on goals that you alone can reach, and he must never reach them or your goal is jeopardized. Can love have meaning where the goal is triumph? And what decision can be made for this that will not hurt you? See, you cannot join in specialness through difference because his difference is what helps you reach your goal. Not sameness. Not joining, but being different. And so the purpose must be changed in our dealing with our brother. 
the goal must change. The goal is no longer differentiation and specialness. The goal now is oneness and wholeness or holiness, and therefore the means to it is changed as well. And the Holy Spirit takes everything that was a means for specialness, makes it a means for holiness. And this idea of triumph, of course, says that every special relationship is nothing more than two people, two separate minds that's trapped in bodies that believe they can triumph over one another. Both of them think they're going to win the game. And this really is a game because it's not real. One little thing I'd like to yeah, put go ahead. into that. that if you go back and think about what Jesus said as he presented us with his course, he said, look, I'm your elder brother. He said, we're the same. I'm seeing only the wholeness and the face of Christ. I'm seeing all the brethren in the face of Christ. You don't see that yet. But we are exactly the same. This is about me being your elder brother. I take the role, not the father's role, but the role of an elder brother that calls to my brethren to see what I saw. All the brethren in the face of Christ. And that they're all the same and that they're all one. And that's exactly what the next verse says. It says, your brother is your friend because his father created him like you. There is no difference. So there's no difference between you. It doesn't matter if you've never heard or read A Course in Miracles or wherever you are, because you are the same as all of us. You are the Holy Son of God. This idea of uh, desire for specialness is a lonely, lonely state of mind because it's all for itself, this little ego idea. It's not shared. There's no joining. The Course says minds cannot attack. So what you did is you made illusions so that you could attack those illusions. So this goal is an illusion. It's an unattainable goal of being the king of the mountain by being different and therefore being special through that concept of difference. I've been spending a lot of time with the thought of contrast. The illusion can only be seen with a mind that can see with contrast. And that is a mind that's chosen to see difference, see levels, see conflict, see by comparison. And then from that, make a judgment or make a decision as to what is valuable and what is not valuable. For this purpose, to attain the goal that that idea has for a self that is separate from all other selves. It's a competition. My goal's better than your goal. But if it's a my, then it's got a goal, and its goal is better than your goal. And we're talking about triumph, which means there's a winner and a loser. Absolutely. And the ego thought, the individualized, separated, special thought that you have bought into at some point to believe that it is you, you can't be in anything else but this competition to triumph. Now, in the American dream, the triumph is riches and fame and all that. It's not necessarily that. It can be, I'm going to be the poorest person and I will win or the most accident-prone person on earth. Right. I'll win that. Unconsciously, you're not aware of that goal. But you're achieving that goal because the mind follows the purpose. The means and the meaning of life follow the purpose of life. And the purpose of life in the ego thought is nothing but death. you got to realize that we chose to be different. And we equated specialness with difference. So it doesn't matter what the difference is, just like you said. The important thing in this insane idea is that I be different. And in my difference from you, I cannot join. I am special in my difference. We made bodies to project and to see a world of differences, but bodies individualize a mind that cannot be any different than another mind because they're joined in the one mind. And so each body appears different. It changes every day. You look in the mirror, it's different. From the time the image goes to the mirror and a light and comes back, it's already changed. But we try to differentiate by 
clothing and jewelry. And when that's not enough, we, we put on makeup and we change our hair colors and we start tattooing ourselves to individualize. How can I stand out and be different when everybody else seems to be doing the same thing or acting the same way? I saw something interesting. I was watching a special about the oldest mummy they found. And it's 5,300 years old. And this mummy was frozen. So it's the flesh. It's interesting that it's the flesh that differentiates. That's why they were so interested in this is because bones aren't going to tell you a whole lot. But flesh will tell you a lot. The skin was actually still on this mummy. And guess what he had? He had about 120 tattoos. 5,300-year-old corpse had tattoos. Tattoos is nothing different. And the other interesting thing about this was when they x-rayed it and an expert in x-ray looked at it, everyone had missed it, but the guy, this 5,300-year-old, the oldest mummy, the oldest flesh known to us as human beings, had an arrowhead in it, which means he was murdered. <laughs> Here's the oldest body we can find, and it's testifying to hate and murder and attack, vengeance and Somebody won. Somebody killed him and took all his stuff. Well, see, I go back to what we said about the body. The symbols were made to attack the symbols. So how can you play this out except through symbols? So it's not there's anything wrong with going and putting tattoos on. You're just a symbol of a thought that's hidden, that you've buried. And what the Holy Spirit is doing and using this course to do is to show you what is it for? Why are you doing this? This is why you're doing this. So you can understand that it's not in the doing. Mm-hmm. It's in the knowing right. behind the doing that this is all about. It's to get out of this cycle of valuation, uh, evaluation, preference, choosing, and thinking that that is good judgment or judgment that's going to lead you to some place of salvation in any aspect of existence. And it can't. Judgment is the exact opposite of atonement. Well, see, the power of contrast. I have dealt with photography and videos as long as I can remember. And contrast makes up everything. Everything. There's not anything that's not dealt with in contrast. And there's a reason for that. And the Holy Spirit says, I take time. And I use time to wake you up. So where you have taken the contrast of she's right and he's wrong or I'm right and she's wrong and the contrast of judgment through perception, the Holy Spirit says, what I want to get you to is to where you begin to see that there is a true and that there's a false. We're talking about the false in this and the course is bringing to us the picture of the truth. Now, the only purpose in contrast now is that I see what's real and what's not real. And when I see that, I embrace what's real. Now, judgment goes because I'm perceiving reality and I'm not judging between she's right and he's wrong. I'm seeing that doesn't matter. That's just a symbol of the contrast of illusions. What I'm seeing now is I'm seeing the truth. So therefore, I make the final judgment in this, and that is, I don't need judgment. I don't need perception because we're all the same, which right, gets me need, back here to the same. So. You, you don't need contrast. The Holy Spirit uses contrast, uses all these things to give us his judgment, to accept his judgment, only to go beyond that right. to where all these things that were made for difference, for conflict, for contrast, fall away as shadow, wispy shadows that are meaningless. They're understood as totally meaningless. Your brother is your friend because his father created him like you. There is no difference. You have been given to your brother that love might be extended, not cut off from him. What you keep is lost to you. This is talking about the law of creation. It says your brother has been given to you that love might be extended. So in the creation, in the father's thought are many thoughts, and we understand how that functions when we see our brother correctly because we see that we are extending love in perception. We choose to extend love and thereby find and realize the treasure of love that we are, which is limitless, 
and that must increase. There is always an increase. It says what you keep is lost to you. So the minute you stop extending, which you would have the end time, having a minute to stop extending, but if you stop extending, you have broken, you have distorted the law of creation. You're trying to substitute it for some other order of thinking, some order of making rather than creating, and it is dead. It is the thought of death. The thought of life is a life of extension and union. See, it says where we started here that if you cannot extend, you cannot stand when you have established that there's a goal that you can attain by yourself as separate from your brother. But the other side of that is that you recognize when you see your brother as yourself, there is no difference. And now you experience your goal. What is your goal? The Course says the Father made the Son to be happy. Peace is your goal. Happiness is your goal. Mm -hmm. The joy of knowing and being one with your Father, with the brethren, as the Father is one with the Sonship. In the Course, Jesus tells us that even in this world we can make happy because we can extend Sonship and brotherhood to those who have forgotten their sonship and brotherhood. And if you've forgotten your sonship and brotherhood, you are not happy because the Father extended himself to you as a creation to make you happy and to make you a creator to create happiness, to give happiness. And so once you broke off from your source or attempted to have an idea apart from your source, it had to be unhappy. So anyone that we're looking at without extending sonship, we are agreeing with their unhappiness, and therefore we are making ourselves unhappy. Absolutely. God gave you and your brother himself. And to remember this is now the only purpose that you share, and so it is the only one you have. Could you attack your brother if you chose to see no specialness of any kind between you and him? Look fairly at whatever makes you give your brother only partial welcome, or would let you think that you are better off apart. Is it not always your belief your specialness is limited by your relationship? And is not this the, quote, enemy that makes you and your brother allusions to each other? So it's talking about the idea of special relationships, which, again, have their own goals. They are selfish. They are hateful. They are murderous thoughts. And they are there because we do not see our brother as ourselves. I couldn't help but think of terms that I've heard over the years, and surely I've used those same terms before I knew what I know now. He sucks the life out of me. i got to put some space between me and this. <laughs> See, that's what this is saying. Why would that be? It's because my goals are not being attended to, because I'm having to attend to your goals. So I need some space here. <laughs> Take time, or some time. Or some time. Time out. We need a time out. We need to take some time here. Right. Because the goals of the world are meaningless. Meaningless. And so don't be getting my way because you are meaningless. If you are not helping me to my goal, which is actually from the special relationship is vengeance on the past, is a hateful thought that can never be satisfied, then get out of my way. <laughs> Paragraph 8, the fear of God and of your brother comes from each unrecognized belief in specialness. For you demand your brother bow to it against his will, and God himself must honor it or suffer vengeance. Every twinge of malice or stab of hate or wish to separate arises here. For here the purpose that you and your brother share becomes obscured from both of you. You would oppose this course because it teaches you you and your brother are alike. Well, there's the opposition. (laughs) There you go. I don't want to be alike. So when the person walks in the door to the course group for the first time, there's several things going on that Jesus tells us. Number one, they think they know. Number two, they've got their own goal and it's their world. And number three, I will oppose everything about this course because I am not like you. We are not one. I am special. And if you want to know what the Course in Miracles is about, It's about dealing with this idea that the Son, an aspect, a tiny aspect of the mind, approached the Father with and says, i got an idea. It's called time. And in this time, I'll be special through difference. So I don't want to be like the rest. I don't want to be like you anymore. I want to be different. 
The whole thing rests on that idea. The recognition of this is the release from this idea that I can be special by being different, having my own personal agenda, and using you, but not incorporating you in my agenda. You're only there to be used. This is an awakening, not on the physical level, but on the level of the mind, that the mind is one, and it's always been one, and it always will be one. And we never did pull it off. We never fragmented. We never separated. We come up with a concept. The concept was corrected, and we hung on to the echo. And so we perpetuate an echo of an idea that we're separate and that we're special through it. And the fear of returning is what that thought has surrounded itself with to not see this very thing. This whole course is set up for you to see one thing. You and your brother are the same. That means me and the father are the same. Right, because once you recognize your brother, you remember your father. Right. And when you remember your father, you must remember your creation. Absolutely. Which you continue to create and continue to extend and bring back into union and unification. You have no purpose that is not the same, and none your father does not share with you. For your relationship has been made clean of special goals. And would you now defeat the goal of holiness that heaven gave it? What perspective can the special have that does not change with every seeming blow, each slight or fancied judgment on themselves? This thing of specialness. We are in this presidential season, and we're down to two, apparently two or four picks, depending on how you look at it. But it, it changes every day with every meaning blow. With The, uh, the polls change. They're up. Each slight Oh, man, I put up with a lot of stuff, but I can't handle that, what he said or she said or how she rolled her eyes or whatever. So there's no stability in this thought. Right. And the specialness changes all the time. It's fads and fashions and just about the time you get settled in and think, oh, I'm special. Look at my bell-bottom pants. They don't have bell-bottom pants anymore because we're going to make it special. That's no longer special. So it's constantly changing to keep the differences and the specialness awake and see, to you the can, mind. You can take the personalities out of this because the personalities, there's not one guilty and one innocent, one better or one worse. That's all part of this judgment idea of specialness. What you have to see is that this is merely a reflection of this echo of specialness through difference, and that's all. So how can we attack this thing? Well, we got to make personal. we got to make personalities. we got to have bodies. we got to have this guy's got a history and this lady that's got a history. Stories. So that we can, uh, what? Contrast, compare, judge, and come to a conclusion and then put it in ironclad a law. And now they're locked in. And so... We're perpetuating the echo. That's how the echo goes on. It's by this illusion of attack, which when a symbol is merely a symbol of the thought that no longer exists. We spoke before about the Holy Spirit's role in using contrast. One of the things he contrasts is the echo and the voice of the ego versus the voice for God or the voice from the real world. You begin to realize the effects of whether real or not, consequences are not real, of obedience and following one voice or the other. And it is contrasted until you recognize, I have no need for this echo. That's right. I have no need for this voice. I recognize it's just an echo, which means it's not real. It's just something from the past that is being repeated repeated and repeated and repeated, and it's not real, so I don't have to pay any mind to it anymore. If I happen to listen to it for a second, I stop and I say, well, wait wait a minute, I don't listen to that voice, that's just a remnant, that's wow. just a residue. And you stop thinking, and then you realize all these thoughts you think you were thinking weren't your thoughts at all. And now we're contrasting the thoughts of God, which are the only true thoughts, which are the only thoughts we hold to in the real world view. I had a picture when you were talking just then of us taking of the mind, this little aspect of mind, sticking its head up in a big bale and striking this bell with this thought and just remaining in this ringing echo. And the Holy Spirit shows it the stillness and the quietness of reality by contrast. 
And he says, well, I choose the stillness and the quiet. Why do I keep my head in this ringing bell of conflict? Why do I keep trying to make this thing work when it can never work? Because the mind that thought the thought, it's no longer in the mind that thought it. It's just an echo. It's a ringing bell. But we keep striking the bell every time we attack. We keep striking the bell with our illusion of maintaining the echo. And our attack is, you're different, I'm different. We're not the same. Our goals can never come together. We can never join. Those who are special must defend illusions against the truth. For what is specialness but an attack upon the will of God? You love your brother not, while it is this you would defend against him. This is what he attacks and you protect. Here is the ground of battle which you wage against him. Here must he be your enemy and not your friend. Never can there be peace among the different. He is your friend because you are the same. So we have friends. We can look out in a world of friends who are all the same, all like us. Or we can look out to a world of enemies And the best you can do is have an ally that is associated with your goal to help you win, and only for as long as to help you win your game, your round, your lifetime goal, whatever it is, or whatever they are, goals, and then just to be dispensed with. Talk to the hand. I don't remember you. You can't go with me here. Sorry. Glad to have known you. 